Hi, this is Mike Schrage, president of GMPI here in Joplin, Missouri. And last year we had Faith Greater Than Fear episodes that were just fabulous and they were out every week. This year we've been sharing one about every two weeks, one of them a fresh episode and one curated from last year's best. And this time you're in for a treat because this may be the best of the best that we've had so far to offer you. And I just want to share with you just some quotable quotes, because what we're going to be talking about with these speakers is DMM, disciple making movements, and what God is doing around the world and among us as well. And so as we interviewed people near and far last year talking about DMM, they said things like, Mike, this is scalable gospeling. Mike, this is something so important. It is to the very heart of Jesus's life and death and ministry. And I like what one person said, our purpose in life is to live and to make those within our circle so enamored with God and with heaven that it is impossible for them to go to hell. I like that. So as you listen, I think you're going to like a lot of what you hear. Stay tuned. And Mike, we started praying a dangerous prayer. And I tell people, don't pray this prayer. <laughs> Unless you're willing to give up everything you have to follow Jesus and do what he says, don't pray this prayer. But the prayer, Mike, essentially was, Lord, you told us to pray for 10,000 in the first 10 years. What do you want us to pray about in the next 10 years? What's the prayer you want us to pray? Not what prayer can we make up to pray? Lord, what's on your heart? What do you want us to pray for in the next 10. And Mike, at, at the Coliseum, the 10 year anniversary, we got up and we shared with the church what we felt like the Lord was leading us to pray in the next 10. And we sensed he was wanting us to pray, not for another 10,000 in 10 years, but for a million in the next 10 years. And so you can imagine the Coliseum, everybody's like, is that possible? <laughs> like, a mil How are we going to fit a million people in the building? I mean, can we fit a million? And so I'm sure people were just going, oh, what in the world? But Mike, that led us back to the basically the drawing board. And, uh, you know, uh, shortly before we made this announcement, we put a million at the top of the white uh, whiteboard in the, uh, you know, in the conference room with our leadership team in there. And we just said, if the Lord's given us this prayer, this million in 10 years, how are we, how are we going to do that? Mike, it didn't take us but about 30 seconds to, to recognize we can't keep doing what we've been doing. If we want to reach a million in the next 10 years, nothing wrong with what we've been doing, but what we've been doing, Mike was addition. We were adding people to the kingdom, which was great. We knew that to, with the million on the whiteboard, we knew that to see a million in the next 10 years, if that's the prayer God had led us to pray, Mike, we would have to see the multiplication of disciples and churches. And, uh, and I think at the 10 year anniversary, Mike, everybody's excited, but we recognize that over time, as we began to roll this out and that it was going to, it was going to, the cost was going to be that everybody in the, in the chairs sitting and usually just enjoying the services was going to have to become a disciple maker. And, and, and ultimately, as a natural result, a, a church planner, because when you make disciples, Jesus plants the church, so we're indirectly church planners. Mike, that gets scary, you know, because a lot of people love just going to church and enjoying great church services. Not everybody's ready to go make disciples of all nations, you know. And so um, so we shared it with the church. We said, this is the direction we're going. And uh, we had many people say, yes, this is awesome. And join us. And we had many people decide that for the next 10 years, you know, the Lord was going to move them on to a, a different church. It would be more like a traditional church where they could just enjoy church on Sunday morning rather than really being a part of a mission where every single person would have to be involved and would have to be a disciple maker. I would say from the outside, obviously, a cost of this is we, we projected, Mike, that we would um, have an attendance decline, which we did, and that we would also have, you know, uh, the giving go down, which it definitely did. But, Mike, we were prepared for that. And we knew here's what's great about movements. It doesn't take 5,000 people like we had on a weekend to reach a million. In fact, in movements with multiplication, the saying often goes, a team of two to three can reach 100,000. That blew our minds. A team of two to three can reach 100,000 with a multiplication methodology. So Mike, that told us 10 teams of two to three can reach a million. So he knew, just like Jesus knew with his 12 disciples, Jesus didn't have to have the crowds of thousands to get his mission accomplished, right? 12 guys, 12 guys and one, the defect, 11 guys could get the job done. By becoming bivocational, we were basically saying to the people that we were talking to, hey, you don't have to be full-time in ministry to be a disciple maker and church planner. 
And Mike, I think until we became bivocational, people could easily say that. Well, it's easy for you to say, Chris, you make disciples and plant churches. You're paid full time to do it. So, Mike, we really sense let's not be paid full time to do this and let's keep doing it so that nobody can say, hey, you got to be paid full time to anybody can do this. Anybody, any ordinary person with a job, businessman, woman can do this. Mike, if any ordinary person wants to be a part of a movement, they just need to be set so on fire for God that like John and Peter, even if they're unschooled and ordinary, they can't stop speaking about what they've seen and heard. And if all the people in the pews, Mike, not just the ones on stage, but the people in the pews will get fired up, they would ask the Lord to help them repent of all lukewarmness in their life. And they'd be set on fire for Jesus and wouldn't be able to stop speaking about what they've seen and heard. We'd see miraculous movements of God break out all across this world. We need the order. Mike, it's not just, you know, talk to the pastors. We, we need the pastors to catch this vision so that they can empower the ordinary people to go out and make disciples and plant churches. Unless, Mike, ordinary people are making disciples and planting churches, we're not going to see movements. And one, one last thing from India that's so great is if you go to India and some of these movements, Mike, that you'll ask somebody, hey, what do you do for a living? And the ordinary people, and they'll say, I'm a taxi driver, but I'm actually a church planner. I'm a teacher, but I'm actually a church planner. I'm a doctor. I'm actually a church planner. Mike, the ordinary people own the mission and they see themselves as church planners in America and anybody else in anywhere in the world that's watching this. We've got to come to a point where we go. It's not just the pastors that are supposed to obey the Great Commission. God can use us to make disciples. And when you make disciples and they gather together in groups as they're saved and baptized, Jesus plants churches. And so indirectly, you're a church planner. Well, uh, so disciple making movement is it's really a simple concept. It's the idea uh, or a movement. Let's say it's a movement of people uh, that's viral. It's gone viral. So it's a, a person who shares the gospel with someone who then very quickly shares it with someone else who then sh quickly shares it with someone else. So it, it, it grows exponentially. And uh, there are different definitions of you know, how you would measure a movement or what you might call a movement. Uh, one of the definitions we use is if it now has 100 churches that are four generations deep, we count that as a movement. And I think using that definition, there are probably more than 1,300 movements across the globe right now. So North Boulevard, for uh, a number of years, we were calling ourselves a disciple-making church, but we were adding members, but not really multiplying. And um, we began to ask God, help us to figure out, well, how do we multiply? How do we go from just adding people to multiplying? We've planted about 250 churches now since we started this process. And, um, it, and, and, and this time next year, it'll, it'll, be, it'll be twice that many. It'll be 500 churches pretty easily. And uh, there are many of them are in the global south. So what we do is we are providing the training for individuals who then go and become catalysts in various places, mostly in uh, West Africa and some places in North Africa and a little bit in the Middle East. And it's just a thrilling place to be because you just you have, we have people um, who are animists. We have numerous Muslims who are professing faith in Jesus, and uh, the little churches are born out of that. So, so it's a thrilling thing, in my opinion. This is the, this is the, this is the biggest thing God's doing right now. It's certainly the biggest visible thing God is doing on planet Earth right now. And so, one thing the pandemic should do is really help us to refocus. I think another thing that it's done is probably reminded us that that big Western attractional church model um, has a lot of value. We still do it. We we still like it, um, but it it probably has a shelf life on it. it it's going to surprise me. Well, I won't be around to know, but it would surprise me if it goes another fifty years. Um, I just think that the the movement of the gospel is back towards small groups, house churches. Um, this is certainly what's happening in the global south, and that provides people with a lot more personal challenge to just read scripture and obey it and then enjoy the blessing God immediately provides oftentimes and then to share that with someone else. So maybe it's an accelerator of a new way of doing church. What makes Disciple, uh, Discovery Bible Study work, DBS, what makes it work is not the study part. What makes it work is the obedience part. So this is what we find in uh, West Africa. We sit down with someone, typically not a Christian, because the Christians, they've all been spoiled. We want to learn something. We don't want to do anything. Uh, you sit down with a non-Christian, you read a verse about forgiveness, let's say. And what they'll say is, OK, let's meet back you know, three days. But who do you want to forgive between now and then? What This verse teaches forgiveness. Who do you want to forgive? And they may say, well, I've got a cousin or whoever it is. OK, I want you to go forgive them. 
And then when we meet again, I want you to tell me how it went. Now, this is a person who may not even know the name of Jesus. And then Isa, perhaps from the Muslim tradition, but they don't really know anything about Jesus. They're not Christian yet, but they go, they forgive, and they get an immediate blessing. They can't believe how well it went. And so when they come back, they were excited. And they, their, their question is, show me another one of these things. What's another thing I can do? And through obedience, they come to know Jesus. Well, they're so excited. They're sharing with all their friends. And this is what makes it go viral. Without the obedience part, it, it never goes viral. So I'm trying to argue that in the book, that obedience is not a form of bondage. It's a beautiful thing. It's liberating. You know, following Jesus' teachings on forgiveness is not bondage. It's liberating. Mm. So I, I want to encourage North Americans to recover this, the gift, the beauty of obedience. And I'll just say this. I think one reason why DBS is not that effective in North America is because we don't do the, we don't do the obedience part of it. So we'll sit around, look at DBS, see what, what, what do we, what, is it, what do we think it means? You know, we'll talk about all of our feelings and so forth and pat each other on the back and go home. If you don't obey, the blessing doesn't come. Well, we came out of Willow Creek. Uh, we were a, a classic seeker church in that uh, mode. Our Sunday morning service was all about reaching the lost. Uh, but we realized uh, after about 10 years and, and watching the growth that we were experiencing that we were going to grow out of our campus, have to buy land, build a new building. And we just didn't want to get into uh, sinking that many uh, resources into those kinds of, of assets. And so we began to look for something. Uh, at that point, our, our terminology, terminology was, uh, is there any scalable model of gospeling that exists? We looked around the U.S. and we saw a lot of things, uh, but, but didn't find anything. Um, uh, but we, we found overseas some folks that began to uh, take us under their wings and help us understand what this multiplicative disciple making, where disciples make disciples make disciples. And you, you begin to see these small enclaves of biblically functioning communities just develop, uh, which uh, ultimately are an expression of ecclesia, you know, the church that, that Jesus said he would build himself. So um, we, we began to, to practice that and, or, or pursue that, I guess. And as we did, we, we needed a framework to figure out who we were and um, how, how do we help people understand that? And that's where the hybrid car analogy became a real uh, a picture for us that we had this Sunday morning thing, still attractional, people still come. Uh, we still see people come to faith and baptize them and uh, that, you know, that works like it. We always thought it would, but um, there's this other side. Another was just planting these small uh, groups that existed in a community. And, and there were groups that were for lost people. And we invited our friends, neighbors, and relatives to the table and asked them to read the Bible with us and discover what God had to say about life. And lo and behold, um, we, we realized that people did want to know more about the Bible, and they were eager, and they were just afraid of us, afraid of us cramming something down their throat, telling them what to believe, uh, those kinds of things. And when we created these safe spaces for them, uh, people would come, and they would get their fingerprints on the Bible and, and discover that you know God does want to be their father. And it took shape over a longer period of time. It wasn't like an altar call or a prayer prayer or those kinds of things. It was a, a much more gradual experience as, as people began to, to understand who God was and that he wanted to be their father. And, um, you know, we have a 1,200 seat auditorium, 435 parking spaces, and we feel like we serve an area of about 300,000 people. Uh, they're not all coming on Sunday morning. Um, and we, we couldn't offer enough services in a week uh, to get them all there. Um, and so we realized that if we were going to be responsible uh, for their eternity, and we, we use this concept we call a circle of accountability, and we draw a circle on the map, and we say, look, uh, I want to be responsible for the lostness in that circle. Mm -hmm. And, and I, before God, I just want to say, I want to make it hard for those people to go to hell. And so uh, we, as we drew our big circle, uh, we realized that, that we needed to uh, – have a different strategy. And so now uh, as COVID comes, we're, we're moving already toward building this micro church network uh, in our area and COVID hits and just people just come out of the woodwork saying, how did you know? How did you know? <laughs> and so here I'm about 50 years old. 
uh, our organization says, well, why don't you go and work on a PhD program studying how the intersection between media and churches and uh, and movements are, are going, church planting and movements. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is really a bad idea. I barely got out of high school. I'm like, you know, it's not the sharpest crayon in the box. God, this is not a good idea. But I just felt God pressing me to do this. And so we applied to different schools and was accepted in, uh, in Wisconsin uh, to research how media uh, and movements in Islam persuade, uh, intersected. So we thought if we learn how Islamic movements start, then we can actually take those same principles and put them over the church planting. And uh, soon after that, uh, Homeland Security heard about what I was wanting to research. So they actually funded my whole education. And I found myself running with some pretty high-end uh, researchers on using, on identifying how media and Islam and movements. And cutting the short story, God taught me, taught us some very significant things. We published a lot of journal articles and the material that we developed in school is still being used by uh, Homeland Security to train their, their um, the people who are working in this type of sphere. But able to come out of that and apply these same kinds of principles to her, over in the Christian media world, and what we are looking, what the big, the big finding was that media is terrible about persuading people to become believers, but it is good at identifying people who are open for religious change. We end up developing a, a group of us together who are thinking about this sort of thing, and we created a, a, a team called Media Media to Movement, Media to Lead to Church Planning Movements, and then we had a team in North Africa um, who began applying it. And uh, we began to apply in Indonesia and saw God just do tremendous things there. So um, it was it's pretty exciting, pretty exciting work. So if you look at the book of Acts, of the 21 conversion experiences in the book of Acts, 19 of them are group oriented. Paul was one. Uh, the, um, the Ethiopian eunuch was a single individual, but all the rest of them are groups. So we have to change our paradigm of how conversion occurs to actually make it a group experience and actually helping people start house churches and, and house Bible studies instead of going and joining an existing house church. From the harvest will come the harvesters. So no longer will the professional workers be the harvester, mm. but it's going to be the individual who is running his own house church movement. So we have to think about how to train uh, lay leaders to become leaders in their own house churches and then kind of put that together to become the church of Ephesus, even though it was about 10 or so house churches. For me, I think it's a time for us to rethink how we how disciples make disciples. It's not done by the professional up front, but we ourselves make disciples of those around us. And disciples don't necessarily have to be someone who can can do the you know the name all the six six books of the Bible and uh, the tenets of faith. It's how they can learn to have an experience with God. Disciples not a position obtained, but it's a relationship maintained. So how can we help people have a maintaining persistent relationship? So I think the big challenge for us is how do we rethink church in a modern age? Well, I mean, like the first, I think the first year, it 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 was like 350 baptisms, uh, which was just a, on way more than we'd ever thought possible. And but in every year, it's doubled, tripled. So uh, last year we had uh, three thousand. No, 5,617 baptisms. We had ni about 940 new groups, discipleship groups. So, so the, I think this is, this is sort of a, uh, a push a little bit more from the Lord to, hey, I mean, Terry and Amy might not be coming back. Depends <laughs> on if this virus stops, you know. So, so you guys got to get to where you can, you can do this on your own. And they, I mean, they, they do it so much better than we 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 could ever think about doing it so um and that's what they have wanted as well i mean we from the very beginning that was our intent to um create something in partnership with uh Ghanaians to in order to leave them with a ministry that they ran that they were responsible for yeah. and, and in charge of so it's just up the ante a little bit of for uh, when since COVID is, has come into play. So I, what, what I've been surprised about is how busy we've been uh, since we've been back because, uh, because I've, I've taken on 14 different coach, coach, Zoom a coaching uh, tasks with, 
with uh, people from all over Africa. I mean, like six or seven different countries. And, and th that's a lot of fun. I, I just hope that it in, ends up uh, with fruit for the Lord and, and disciple, disciple making movements. But then all those studio files, all those chapters that were digitized are now on the internet. So, I mean, many of the, only the segment leaders right now are accessing them because I, you know, I help them with uh, being able to get connected to the internet and tablets and things so they can download uh, chips, burn their own chips for people that they're, they're working with. But uh, the, I mean, it's, it's working. It's given us time to do that. I could have never uploaded 10,000 files in Ghana in 10 years. <laughs> but here, yeah, I mean, that literally is, is how many files that since we've been home since March 25th that I've uploaded into SoundCloud and, and put on our internet a link so, link so they can go to whatever mother tongue language if they live in that area and, down, and listen to it or download it. So uh, to me, the phrase that keeps coming back to me is, I want this more than you. I mean, from God. Uh, it's, um, I almost feel or hear him saying that. And, and it's mostly because the way things happen is not my strat. It's not what I've strategized and put down as goals. It's more responding to the open doors that he's given us. And that continues. Don't uh, invest all your energy worrying about things that, that uh, God's got. got to, got it he's got it taken care of already for me it's been uh even if we can't be in country um that he still has stuff for us to do and that's pretty exciting to me you know we're not we're not done yet i i just believe with all of my heart that in every location in the world including here in the united states that there are people who have never heard or who have never had the opportunity to hear it in a way where good news really hits to the heart of who they are. They, they hear a lot of times here in the States about what we're against or what we don't like, or unfortunately cultural Christianity creeps into it or whatever else, but to just be introduced to Jesus and to hear good news is such a privilege that we have. And so social media is one of those tools. It's not the only one, but wow, using social media, paid marketing, Google, others, it's it's exciting times because of the scale of it to me that just it's just it's humbling we want to be with other people we want to to laugh we want to hug we want to be around them and, and lord willing someday that's going to happen again but there's also parts to things that i think we can still use from what we're doing right now even in the future and so learning from this uh, maybe small group type stuff checking in with people calling on our, our people, our elderly, just learning how to do a FaceTime call with people. All of these things can help us be the church, be good news. And then the other part I would say would be really in my wheelhouse of the marketing part of a church. And a lot of times that may sound bad or leave a bad taste in people's mouths, but we're, we're really just proclaiming and we're trying to get that good news in front of somebody who's actually looking for it, who is seeking one of the things that I'm noticing is that many church websites don't even have a, a the, what's called the Facebook pixel installed on their site, which can tell you when somebody comes to your site and what are they looking at or are they searching. Even if you're not running ads, getting Google Analytics installed on your site, you can now see when someone comes to your site, what are they looking for? And they're telling you, it's like a person walking into a business and they tell the sales clerk, you know, I'm looking for fly fishing rods or something like that. They're telling you what they're searching for spiritually or what things are important to them. And so these insights, this information, this data, and the ability to retarget, in other words, send an ad about prayer or we're here to help if you need some food or whatever you might need to people, to the people who are seeking for those things or who have looked at those things. That can be a really valuable tool and you don't have to spend very much, literally like a dollar a day. So we're talking about a very low ad spend when you do something like that. And so these are just tools that I, I hope that more and more churches will learn to use and to leverage to really just multiply their impact within their communities. 
Well, there was a, a lady in the eastern part of our country that there, there, there's no missionaries, no, no believers that we know of. In our whole country, there's only 400 known believers out of about 4 million people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's pockets of the whole country that, just, that, that there's no hope, there's no light, um, and it is a dark place. Um, but we ran an ad in a major city near this village. And, you know, it's not an exact art. So the ad actually was running in the villages surrounding the city. And this lady uh, responded to us and basically was saying, listen, I've been having these dreams about Jesus, about this man, this Jesus. I don't know who he is. Um, but he keeps telling me that I have a, a message, that he has a message for me that I need to share with other people. Can you help me understand who that is? Um, and so we got her connected with a disciple maker that was here on the ground. And, um, I mean, her faith was boom. She, that, that day she said, I want to, I want my life to be all about this. Um, and again, miles and miles away, hundreds of miles away from any known believer. Um, but she had a phone uh, with Facebook on it. And so we, she, she, she responded to that. And there's other stories like that. Um, we say often, um, you know, we used to fish with a fishing pole one at a time, you catch one fish at a time. And you know, if you've ever been fishing, sometimes you don't catch, catch anything, but you're trying for one at a time. And now we're, we're using a net um, and we can, we can just broaden our search, broaden the seed that we sow. And let me stop just real quick. That doesn't mean we shouldn't fish with a pole. I still fish with a pole and, and do the one-on-ones and, and my daily life looks the same in some ways as it did before. This is simply a tool that has expanded our reach and expanded our uh, ability to see where where is God working. Uh, we do believe that, that he is the one that opens the hearts of men and women. We don't open the, the, the hearts. We're just looking for those open hearts. And so this tool is just such a gift, uh, such a joy after you know a decade of fishing the pole to grab a net. Wow, wasn't that fabulous material? Uh, no, God is using these men and women in wonderful ways, and may we join their ranks. So if you enjoyed this episode that was curated, please share it on your own social media channels. Share it with people that you know and love. There's a podcast version as well. And I just wanted to highlight this last excerpt as we close on this one, where Terry Ruff said these things, missionary in Africa that said, you know, I know God said to me these words clearly. I, meaning God, want this disciple making movements in my heart more than even you do. Isn't that true? So until next time, may you go out and make disciples. May you be blessed for in another couple of weeks, another fresh edition of Faith Greater Than Fear.